Um, good evening, OPN. I want to welcome all you guys that are on the channel viewing with us tonight. Thank you for being here. And also the uh, other channels that are mirroring us and sharing this evening. We're very fortunate to have uh, a new friend of mine that I met a few months ago, Courtney Baines, who is an instructor at Appalachian State University a couple of counties over and also works with the Blue Ridge Women in Agriculture Project. So we're going to follow up on last night's movie, which was Edible City that we all watched and enjoyed. And Courtney's going to give us some of the rundown about what's happening in the field of sustainability because um, as, as I learned when I met her, Appalachian State actually has a degree program in sustainability. So welcome, Courtney. Thank you for being here on OPN tonight. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. <laughs> um, why don't you give yourself a better introduction than, than I did? You know, a little bit about your background and, and where you are and what it is you're doing here at the moment. All right, sure. Um, that was a wonderful introduction. Thank you. Um, and uh, as Mark said, I am currently teaching for the Sustainable Development Program. I teach the Principles of Sustainable Development, which is the intro course to our degree program. And at the same time, I'm working for a nonprofit here in Boone called Blue Ridge Women in Agriculture. And we work to strengthen the high country local food system by providing resources and a variety of different workshops and educational events for the community. So um, it's really great. It's a great combination of all the things that I love to do and uh, I really get to plan a lot, a lot of amazing events and also work in the classroom and there's a great overlap there because the students uh, are always interested in what's going on at Blue Ridge Women in Agriculture. Um, how I came to Boone, a little background, I came here for graduate school back in 2007 and uh, received a, a master's degree within the same program that I'm teaching in now. So I've always loved Boone, and I feel very fortunate that I was able to come to school here. And then now I'm grateful to be stuck here with amazing jobs doing the things I love. So. Um, well, that's good, and I want to I wanna make sure we touch on both of these because as, as we were talking off air, when I was researching the details on you, it's like not only is there a sustainability program at ASU, but this Blue Ridge Women in Agriculture is is you know very big and very active. So uh, I want to be able to touch on both of those um, as much as we can. So before we go too far into this, why don't you provide the viewers your definition of sustainability? All right, certainly. Um, this is actually a lot of what my course talks about being the intro course to sustainable development and if you want to have the official definition which was coined by uh, a UN Commission back in 1987 the official definition is development that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability for future generations to meet their needs so very much this broad-based concern for current generation, meeting the needs, and also considering the future. Um, however, if you look at just the word needs, that's often hard to define. Um, I, can they, I'm not sure if they can see the type pad here. Um, yeah, they have the link to look at it as you're, okay. as you're going along if they'd like. Sure. Um, on, on the pad, I just I posted um, a few definitions from a couple of the professors that are in our program. Um, because the reason I did that was defining sustainability often becomes a personal thing, but I think as long as your definition involves figuring out a way to better live on the planet, and for me that's finding a way to balance um, economics and environmental concerns, and then also equity, which is a way of saying social justice. So we often use the terminology, the three E's, economics, environment, or ecology, and equity. And when I'm talking to my students, I tell them it's 
like using 3E goggles. And I know I'm going off on a tangent no, here. No, but this is great. <laughs> um, it's this analogy that's saying, you know, if you have 3D goggles, like the old-fashioned ones, and you're looking at this old-fashioned 3D book with the red line and the blue line and the black line, if you look at just the red line, you see one thing, black line, etc. Same thing goes in our world today. If you look at just environmental issues, you're going to see one picture, one set of problems, one set of solutions. With the economic lens, if you're just looking at economics of things, one set of problems, one set of solutions. Um, same thing with social justice. But if you put on your 3E e goggles, <laughs> it creates this whole new vision of the interconnect interconnectedness and complexity that you begin to realize, you know, one solution in this realm of, you know, environmental concerns could very well create negative consequences with social justice or with economics or vice versa. So it's not that sustainability lens or understanding sustainable development will give you clear answers of how to fix everything, but it will teach you to remember constantly that everything is connected and if we're going to talk about solutions, we need to make sure that those solutions consider all these different realms. So um, that's I, my I, definition. No, that, that was great. And I particularly like the, the fact that you, you consider the term equity in there because sometimes you know that's you you achieve these goals at what expense and you know the consideration of the whole is very important and sometimes quite quite often missed and when I was promoing your show on my very own I was like you're going to talk about sustainability in a comprehensive manner which addresses <laughs> these things so I'm glad that I that I was on on track with that um why don't you give us a little bit of background about the Sustainable Development Program at ASU, uh, the mission, vision, how it started, and the relationship to the rest of the school? Because as as we talked briefly, I understand it's multidisciplinary, which is which is somewhat unusual, and so therefore it is integrated. So give us a rundown of the program there. Um, of course. So. Um, first, I do want to say that um, I'm speaking from my experiences and my knowledge, um, and I apologize if I misstate anything, um, but I do have a deep love for the program at ASU um, and a fairly comprehensive knowledge of the history. Um, in 1991, it was established as a program through a variety of forward thinkers, um, Jeff Boyer being one of the, the major spearheads. Um, uh, the major person spearheading this this program and so therefore it's the oldest sustainable development program in the country to my knowledge and I've done research on this so there could be something else out there but from what I know um, and beginning in 1996 uh, people could um, or students could receive a concentration uh, for the master's program in sustainable development so um, it started as a mini program where like anthropology students could say I want to focus in sustainable development biology students could say I want to concentrate in sustainable development so it was a a smaller kind of tack on program um, but it was a, you know a working recognized program um, in 2008 we began offering you could get an, a, a whole degree in sustainable development and so it's, it's our sustainable development program is an academic department. Um, we offer two degrees. You can get a Bachelor of Science or a Bachelor of Art. Um, the BS degree, you can concentrate in agroecology, sustainable agriculture. You can concentrate in global regional community development, or you can concentrate in uh, environmental studies. So um, it is so attractive to many students um, and can really focus on a wide variety of um, interests because sustainability encompasses such a wide variety of issues. Right, right. Um, so it works out really well. Um, so that's a bit of the history. Um, and as far as its relation to the rest of the university, um, we are often confused with um, another fairly new program, um, which is the Office of Sustainability, which is a campus-wide um, 
group, a campus-wide organization that works on everything from um, the facilities, so looking at our energy loads and recycling, and um, we work very closely with the Office of Sustainability. Um, I provided a link to their office, um, which is sustain.appstate.edu, um, whereas ours is sd.appstate.edu. So we're the academic program. Then there is the the Office of Sustainability, Sustainability, which is the wider campus sustainability operations. Um, and then there's another program that uh, we work really well with, and it's the Appropriate Technology Program, um, which really focuses on renewable energy. Um, so their hands-on component, component uh, deals with appropriate technologies. Our hands-on component deals with a whole host of things, outreach, sustainable agriculture. Um, but we really emphasize the importance of this social justice and equity. Um, so it's not just energy. Um, it's not just uh, sustainable business. Um, it is this, this all-encompassing um, issue. And we, and we take pride in, you know, really just plugging that into our students so that, that they, they leave with this holistic understanding of the issues at hand. Yeah. Um, and so were some of the, the departments you, you listed before, um, were, are those the disciplines that are involved or do you have like anthropology students? And can you, can you describe how that, like what's your student population in your program? Where are they coming from? What disciplines? Sure. Um, well, since now we are um, our own department, we do have students that identify themselves as sustainable development students, just as a biology student would say, I'm okay. a biology uh, yeah. major. So um, since um, 2008, um, we have students that can say, I'm a sustainable development major. Um, However, we do still offer the concentrations within other departments, so um, or minors as well. So, yeah, anthropology has a lot um, of students interested in our courses. Uh, biology, geography, um, you know, the, the planners, and we have some um, business students that are, that are taking our courses and or minoring in sustainable development. So, um, it really offers itself. Um, to work really well with a whole, whole host of other departments and we still consider many, um, we have 11, I believe it's 11 departments around campus um, that we consider our, our friends, our, um, our partners, so biology, anthropology, these, um, these departments that work really well. Um, this is I'm going to just throw this one out there because it's, I think it's fascinating. Can you describe like the day in the life of the average sustainable development student? What, are they, <laughs> what does their day look like? Um, well, I must admit, I don't believe I've spent a whole day with <laughs> I'm a sustainable development student. Um, but for some of our students, they have the opportunity to live and work at our um, sustainable development teaching and research farm. And so we have five student residents that are living on this farm um, and working there. Um, so their days, I can only imagine, are, you know, up at the crack of dawn, tending to the, the, the variety of animals that are out there um, and um, working in the garden and the greenhouse um, and then juggling school because, um, we also pride ourselves um, the high level of academic standard we hold within our department. So it's, um, I can imagine there's a lot of homework. Um, we also encourage all of our students to involve themselves in community projects, mm -hmm. whether it's a requ required part of class um, or they, um, they're working on their internship because we're very much uh, get your hands dirty, you know, experience, experiences outside the classroom setting. Um, that's where a lot of this deep learning, uh, long-lasting learning can happen. So my guess is the life of a sustainable development student um, is very active and uh, very, uh, yeah, they're just, their whole day is, they're always thinking, oh, that's, that's sustainability or that's, 
the opportunity for sustainability. So uh, that's a, my hope. <laughs> an inter integrated, if it's all coming together like you want it to, it's an integrated vision of how to how to live. So you, mm -hmm. you mentioned the, the research farm. So let's talk a little bit about that because I thought it was fascinating and I didn't put all the detail in my notes, but I understand you had an original farm over at Valley Cruces, which is not too far from Boone where the university is. But but now you have a new a new facility in another county, is that correct? That is correct. Um, we were leasing in, uh, land from the Valley Cruces Conference Center, um, which is a beautiful farmland. That farm we still help with, and it's become the fig farm. We're not growing figs, but uh, it stands for Farmer Incubator Project. So we partner with Maverick Farms, which is a, a local farm and uh, very much an activist group um, to help get beginning farmers off their feet. So we provide the, the working farm with the land. Um, I wish I was more well versed in the, the details of how it works, um, but we're in the first or second year now and um, I can't wait to, to begin to hear stories about how that's working. Um, so that, that farm's still in operation, but just in a different way. Um, our new farm, which is located in Ashe County, um, about a 30, 30 minute drive away um, was donated to the university, um, a very large farm. It has two houses on it. Um, one is uh, just full of historical wealth. Um, so there's other departments working on, you know, gathering the history of the house and the land. And there's um, a great massed forest uh, behind the property as well. So um, maybe even now we have, you know, pigs out there just doing what they used to love to do and just dig through the mass forest. Um, we have a variety of heritage turkeys and chickens and cows and um, it's just an amazing place um, that we are teaching specifically sustainable agriculture and agroforestry principles. And it's very odd for a public state um, university to have such a large farm um, that is devoted to sustainable agriculture. Because you can look across the country, you see huge farms that are university run, but it's the large scale monoculture. Like commercial farming. Commercial farming. And yeah. so. And I want to point out to yeah. the people that, that I looked at this place a little bit because um, a lot of times when you have you know institutional like teaching farms, you know, they're five acres, they're 10 acres. The farm she's talking about is 350 plus acres with yeah. pasture land, um, woodland. You might want to explain what the mast is to the people who don't, who aren't familiar <laughs> with that term. Sure. Um, just think of uh, trees that produce uh, nuts that will fall to the ground and then pigs can go in and root it. And I mean, that's the shape of their snout is made for that. And so they are just in hog heaven um, out there. And that uh, was a lot of what, you know, pigs back in the day, you know, that was some of their main uh, source of food. So, so we have the mast is uh, actually like oak trees mostly is how I, I think of it, but anything hickories, pecans, anything that drops, yep. because that's what, what pigs like. And we've actually been priming the audience for this visit because we've done a series on polyphase farms. So ah. if everybody remembers, remember how Joel and the pigs were in the woods and the pigs were the happy pigs, you know, this is the same thing you guys are doing, right? Quite similar? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So, so that's good. Um, what is, you know, somebody asked me this question, which I thought was good, and what is the employment arena like for graduates of a sustainable development program? Well, I will tell you that this is probably the most commonly asked question on our end as well. And I'll answer it um, in a way that I talk to my students. And what I tell them is that Sustainable development to me is, it's a, it's a mindset. It's a way of thinking about the world. And so it's not like they come to our program 
to come out in this perfectly shaped peg that sticks into one particular job. That's that's not our style. Um, my hope is that we get sustainability thinkers in all sectors of society. So politicians, artists, entrepreneurs, um, you know, PR folks, uh, business executives, you know, um, because like I said, it is a way of thinking and I think it is crucial that that mindset fil infiltrates all sorts of uh, different jobs and arenas. So that's the beauty of our degrees is that they allow the flexibility for students to specialize in in what they are most interested in and what their talents are, whether it's um, more on the science end, more on the social end, um, or uh, business. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it does allow that. And um, I do encourage them that, you know, if, if they look at the world and they see all these problems and they find themselves blaming it on one particular sector, then I'm like, that could be the best place for you to go into, you know, to yeah. go in, into the inside, put on the suit and tie, and uh, and change from within. Um, whereas some students are like, no, they want to work from the outside to either create a vision of how they want it to be, you know, and live that way, um, or fight whatever, fight against whatever they see is wrong. So there's there's a whole host of different ways to approach this, and I try to encourage that based on each individual skill and talent and interest. It it's I'm struck by the idea that you're 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 graduating generalists with a very <laughs> deep, hopefully deep range of knowledge, and for some reason you're describing this, and I'm thinking you guys are cultivating a bunch of Wendell Berries there, <laughs> you, you yeah. know, with that whole vision, but able to engage at different levels and all that. And I think it's phenomenal because we've become such a specialized culture to have mm -hmm. a program that's deliberately saying everything's interconnected. Let's look at it. Let's look at a, as things as a whole. Um, right. I think it just speaks so, so well of the program. One <laughs> of the key elements that, that I found by reading the document, documentation on the website and that you have mentioned is community outreach. Um, mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the importance of that in your programming? And I'd like to know, A, how the students respond to that, and B, how the community that you're reaching out to responds to it. Certainly. Um, well, before I get into some of the details of some of our outreach efforts, um, I'll start with my personal take, my personal entry into this whole world um, at Appalachian and of sustainable development. And the master's degree I received was um, within the Appalachian Studies program. So I actually received a master's in Appalachian Studies with a concentration in sustainable development, which is quite the mouthful. But I will admit, at first, I was like, why the Appalachian Studies part? You know, I want to learn the sustainability part. But I very quickly learned that to implement any kind of sustainable solutions, it is crucial to understand the community in which you're working. Uh, that is a key part of the puzzle because there's no one like cookie cutter solution that's going to work in every single place. So place is very important. So as an academic program, we work really hard to emphasize that and so to make that real we work as closely as possible with the community um, so that it's not um, and we don't approach it in a way that hey we have the answer you should implement this but it's going out you know we call it porch sitting uh, just really finding out what is it or how is it that our students can engage how is it that our uh, professors can engage and help and so that's that's the paradigm that we're coming from um, as far as some past projects um, one of the projects we're most proud of or at least from my perspective um, I think is really great is Elk Knob State Park so I'll probably butcher the history a little but um, Elk Knob is this beautiful mountain uh, just on the outskirts of Boone 
um, in the Meat Camp Pottertown area. And my understanding is that there was, of course, someone that had their eye on it to want to develop it, turn it into a gated community, which I love that word. Um, <laughs> gated. I don't see how you can gate a community. But, um, uh, and so a whole host of people got together and ended up saving the park. Now it's, um, it's public space. Uh, it's now a state park and it's just phenomenal, um, to go up there and feel like you're in the wilderness on the top of a mountain so close to, uh, town center Boone. So, um, and still working really hand in hand with the community around Elk Knob. So every year we have um, the Elk Knob Community Days, I believe, where it's a potluck uh, potluck celebration. Everyone comes in. There's like horse and wagon rides and uh, a lot of kind of mountain traditional activities going on. And uh, and it's something we really take pride in and have a lot of fun with. It's outstanding, and and I I wanted to I forgot to give the background at the beginning. We met at a function in Boone, at the Farm Cafe, um, which is a, sort of a community kitchen. You can probably explain this better, but um, you ha did you guys help sponsor Chef Kabui's uh, thing? Was that was the school involved with that? And if if so, if you want to talk a little bit about that, that would be great. As another sure. example. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Farm Cafe uh, actually stands, it's an acronym, FARM, which is Feed All Regardless of Means. And it's an amazing concept where you have a donation box instead of a cash register. Um, and it's based on this principle that all people, no matter what your income might be, have the right to good, healthy local food. And so it's a daily menu, and the chefs do their best to source all their food from locally, which gets very hard this time of year. Uh, but they still, you know, do their best. And um, if you don't have money to pay for the meal, you can just say, I don't have the money. Or uh, what's even encouraged more is to actually work and volunteer in the cafe because it's pretty much volunteer run, so you can help serve, uh, greet, cook, clean, and it's just a really fun experience. So uh, the Sustainable Development Program, um, our faculty were key members on the, in the early stages um, on the board. Uh, myself and my class, or students within my class a few years ago, uh, we helped fundraise and uh, make the website and all sorts of things to really give it some energy and help it get off the ground. Um, and then to this day, we continue to want to keep those connections. And so the the event you're speaking of in November, I think it was November right, right. 17th, um, we invited a chef named Chef Kabui. Uh, he is originally from Kenya, but now he now lives in Durham. And he's just an incredible thinker once again, one of these holistic thinkers that can really tie in indigenous knowledge, historical trends, uh, the state of the economy today, you know, globalization. He's able to just tie these together beautifully. He gave a speech at the university, which was mind-blowing, and then prepared a meal for the community at Farm Cafe that night. And uh, the way we were able to pull it all together, I met him two weeks before the event. So we, just a whirlwind, got this together. But like over 70 people came to the event. We had live music, local musicians, uh, Kenyan-inspired food, and it was just a lot of fun. And we really took pride um, in just bringing the community together and also helping raise money for Chef Kabui's work in Kenya and also the Farm Cafe. Yep. It, it was a great event, and actually it kind of lit, lit me and the friends I was up here to where we've opened a little place and we're doing like free Friday dinners and uh, you know, like, and we we're researching that model and how valuable it was and the turnout yeah. was fantastic and Chef Kabui was such a, a great speaker and a great inspiration and and all the time I'm like I can hear him say I cook for the revolution you know I just <laughs> love that um, so that's a pretty good example of that how um, this touches back on the economics of sustainable development a little bit I was wondering, is is sustainable development considered out there in the world as 
is, for lack of a better term, a legitimate growth industry. Um, you know, do, do business and industry see the need and the value of that, or is that still a long, hard educational process? <laughs> well, um, the answer to that question, um, again, from my perspective, and I tend to lean on the positive. Uh, I just, that's just my philosophy, is always look to the positive. Um, and um, there are many examples, especially of some really well-known companies that are embracing this idea of sustainability. And in their world, they refer to the three E's I was talking about as the three P's, uh, which is people, planet, and profit. So profit is still there for sure because that is the model of our economy, um, whereas many folks still operate under this on this bottom line profit, that's all we do. There are many others that are quickly realizing the consumer demand that the folks that they're buying from do show that it's more than just money. So you see businesses that are making commitments to environmental concerns um, or making sure or it's saying at least that they are um, they're concerned about you know the people involved um, from my critical eye um, I often worry sometimes that something called greenwashing can happen you know sustainability is sexy right now and so you see a lot of companies that are saying these things but the real challenge comes when you start digging in and saying are they really like addressing the issues or are they just painting putting a green sticker on it and saying we're doing good um, so I don't know if I answered your question directly but I see um, then I mean it's gonna be it's gonna require businesses are going to have to take into account um, you know environment and hopefully equity that might be the the hardest part um, and not just treating their workers right but looking where are we supplying our materials from and are those people or is that country you know cutting corners right, right. <laughs> or you know and and that is such a difficult but crucial part of of the whole puzzle and um but long story short yes there is definitely um <laughs> you know the economics of sustainability um has a bright future and I think it's going to be it's going to require businesses to get on board or they're going to lose out. Right. So let's go and take a jump over to the politics of sustainability. <laughs> um because you know we we see this played out every day. Uh and it's interesting that you mentioned the greenwashing because you have on the one hand, oh yeah, we're going to do this. Oh no, there's no money for that, you know, and <laughs> so the political struggles around things, issues of sustainability, food, water, shelter, climate change, you know, it's a sustainability issue. Let's, um, what's the outlook and your a feeling and your opinion on the politics of it, and how does your programming there at the school try to address that? Certainly. Um, this, the answer to this question could last us all week, right? Um, yeah. Because as I mentioned, you know, Sustainable development encompasses such a wide array of issues that the politics are just as big or maybe larger, <laughs> um, or the complexities within the politics. Um, but you mentioned climate change. So a major hurdle I see is how many people, how many of our government leaders are still climate change skeptics, you know? So this is a huge hurdle. To me, one of the major issues that I see uh, one of the largest hurdles um, is looking at this wedding of money and politics. Um, if you look at the Citizens United Supreme Court ruling, um, which says, you know, corporation can give unlimited amounts of money to political campaigns, oftentimes not even revealing who they are. Uh, this, to me, is probably the most pressing issue. And... It's, it does give me hope to know and to research all the groups out there that are working 
to overturn Citizens United or get information out there about what this is and what this means. Um, you have people like Annie Leonard who did Story of Stuff. It's a yep. short three minute video, but she's done Story of Water, Story of Cosmetics, Story of, Story of Citizens United versus FEC. And so programs and activists such, such as this, um, I find are, are crucial. And so I didn't, I by any means answer the question to, you know, politics or outlook, but I do encourage my students um, in my class. I can't speak for the other professors, right, but right. Um, every time we do talk about something, especially in regards to um, issues like fracking in North Carolina or um, the farm bill, um, I encourage them to exercise their citizen muscles, as Annie Leonard would say, and um, let them know that, you know, they do have a voice and they do have power to, um, but only if they use it. So, you know, find out who your representatives are. Um, look into the background of politicians before you go to the polls and goodness me, go vote, <laughs> you know? So I, I do emphasize that in my classes. I try not to push them any way, you know, by saying this person or that person or um, should be Democrat or Republican, but um, I try to frame it in a way that issues of energy and food and um, and these things that are most important to us, clean water, these don't have, they're not red or a blue issue. They, they affect us all and it's important for them to be knowledgeable and to speak out. Speak up. Right. Well, that was, that was well well rounded and summarized. I I got that. I had a question in the chat that um somebody asked if you have any statistics on how many um people the program has graduated and maybe a couple of examples about what what they went on to. Okay, certainly. Um I wish I had the up to date numbers. Um we are in the process of putting together our alumni database. I will tell you that currently we have over 270 majors, which is crazy. That is a huge number for the size and the newness of us as a degree granting program. Um, our first, the first year of graduates was December of 2008. Um, if we were to count all the people since 1991 who concentrated in sustainable development, I wouldn't even know where to begin with that. Um, but some folks that I personally know that were in my principal's class four years ago that have now graduated, um, there are some that have um, gone to work with one of the um, key players in the, um, well, Rio Plus 20, which was the sustainable development meeting that happened in Rio de Janeiro, um, last year. Mm -hmm. Was that 2012? Yes. And um, so he took part in helping to organize that event. He worked in Sri Lanka um, side by side with one of the, the key organizers for that event. Um, we have students uh, working in um, or volunteering their service in AmeriCorps and Peace Corps. Um, we have students that are working in offices of sustainability and campuses around the country. Um, Charleston, um, I think somewhere in Pennsylvania. Um, we have students that have started their own companies. Um, one that's uh, running a, a green cleaning business. Um, one that's um, making a, a local sustainable organic power bars, you know, um, a whole host of, of That's jobs. Amazing. Yeah, yeah right. it's, it's just really like you said earlier about, you know, that that path is not clearly defined, but they leave with that holistic vision and a skill set that they can do. And it yeah. sounds like some of them are just creating things out of thin air, which is even yeah. better. <laughs> yeah. I, I love that. Um, I want to drift away a little bit from ASU. Okay. And I want to talk a little bit about the Blue Ridge Women in Agriculture. Sure. So why don't you tell us, uh, you know, give us an overview of what that is and okay. what your role with them is. 
Sure. Um, so, uh, Blue Ridge Women in Agriculture um, is a nonprofit here in Boone, as I mentioned before. Um, I wish I could give you an exact beginning date. Um, I'm not well versed on the history of the organization, although I know they've been around for well over 15 years. Um, and throughout the years, their mission and vision has kind of um, uh, shifted um, through the years, but um, as I mentioned before, you know, we're dedicated to strengthening the, the food system here in the high country, and our service area is a nine-county region, um, mostly here in um, western North Carolina and then Johnson County, Tennessee. Um, we provide a whole host of workshops and resources and a networking opportunity for female farmers, but we're not focused just on female farmers. Um, the reason for the name and that focus is because, one, that the original group of women that started the group were female farmers that felt underrepresented and felt like they had special hurdles to overcome based on their gender in this predominantly male-dominated field of farming. And so they wanted to just create this this network of female farmers to say, yes, yes, we can. We can do this, right. and right. we'll excel at it. Um, and uh, my role, um, the way I came into Blue Ridge Women in Agriculture was last summer, um, after traveling for the first half of the year, um, some of the board members contacted me and said, we need a farm tour coordinator, and we think you're the person. And I was like, yes, I am. I'm so excited because the farm tour is our largest event of the year. And we last year we featured 22 farms in a three-county area, so um, Ash, Watauga, and Caldwell. And um, it's just a really cool event. It's kind of like a behind the scenes to the farmer's market and farmers open up their gates and let people really see all the hard work involved in the farms. They get to share their stories and it really creates this opportunity for consumers to to see what they're supporting and what their money, if, if they decide to spend their money locally and support local farmers, they get to see the faces of and the families of those folks they're supporting. So it's this beautiful thing. And so I helped with the farm tour. Um, and then I realized they were looking to hire a program director through an, an AmeriCorps position they had just applied for. So um, at kind of a last minute rush, I was like, I want to apply. So they sent me the link. I applied, went through the interview, even though they already knew me. And they said, yes, we'd love to have you. So that's my role now. Um, part, I'm, I'm funded through AmeriCorps, um, and, but fully work for Blue Ridge Women in Agriculture as their director of programs. It's outstanding. I, I, you know, <laughs> having lived here for, for so long, I'd never heard of them. And once I got into the, the website and everything, it's like, oh, my God, this is, this is awesome, the farm tour is extraordinary and I love it because it gets um, it gets people gives people the ability to go to the source yeah you know it's if you're a CSA person and you're going for your pickup you know that's one level but if you're going to the people who are providing your thing and you engage with them on a human level and you see what they go through because uh, farming is not easy work and it, it is not idyllic work as 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 most people like have this picture in their <laughs> mind, it's really grueling and tough and challenging. So it's good to make that human connection. Um, I was wondering if you could describe some of the educational components of that organization, because I know you do, I, I believe you do workshops and community events and things. So let's talk about those. Cause again, with the outreach, right? Sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, yes, we do try to provide, or we do provide monthly workshops. Um, some are focused on farmers. So um, we just had, we just featured a seed saving workshop, which 
Wow, that just, it was an amazing program. Um, Holly Whiteside with Against the Grain Farm, she is so passionate about saving seed, and she's actually making a profit now off saving the seed, so she has to take all these special steps to make sure her tomato plants are a certain distance apart, and it's this beautiful non-scientific science <laughs> um, about how to to space plants, and so she sells her seeds to So True in Asheville. But anyway, she just shared all this information with with her peers, you know, with other farmers that wanted to see, you know, can this really, can this be a benefit to my farm? Um, because whether it's to make money, make an additional income, because you get, you get paid twice. You get to sell your vegetable or sell whatever it is or eat it. And um, depending on the fruit, you get to save the seed too and sell that or use it again. So it was this, this beautiful job. Um, we've, um, done a variety of other workshops that are farmer focused, like irrigation workshops. Um, and then we do other educational events that are focused more on community building or educating the con consumer, um, whether it's canning or how to eat in the de how to eat local in the dead of winter, um, or oh goodness, a whole host of um, a growing mushrooms on logs, you know, <laughs> um, fermenting foods, you know, a whole variety of things. Um, and then more like celebratory events, um, like the Chef Kabui event, or um, we hosted a film showing of um, a small film done by an activist out of Arizona, which was called Greening the Revolution, which was about looking at food and globalization and how in the world there are so many people starving um, and so many people dying of obesity, you know, so looking at these very complex topics as well. Um, but I just love my position because I have the freedom to, you know, juggle all these ideas and then see it start as an idea, idea and then come out as you know, finished product and then get to, to speak with people like you that just had a great time and, and were really positively affected by the event. So it's a beautiful thing. Um, it, it's great. And I, I just love the energy. And it is a nonprofit. When you guys do the workshops, are there charges or fees for that? Or is it kind of like info sharing skills? How do you support that, I guess, is what I'm asking. Well, um I might be in a little trouble because all the workshops I've put on since I've been here have been free. Or if we do um, raise any money, I'm giving it to another organization. Right, I'm right. doing a fundraiser for them. Um, because for me, my overhead, you know, it's covered through AmeriCorps. So my job, um, they don't, they're not having to pay for my, um, right. my work right. out of your Truman and Ag's pocket. Um, when... In the past, there's been workshops that require uh, different equipment, like the fermentation workshop, for instance, where students would actually take home a fermented beverage or a fermented food. Um, they typically would charge like a $5 um, fee. So, right. so it's accessible, um, I guess, is what I'm getting yeah. at, socially and economically accessible, which Definitely. is, which is a, a huge thing for the community and you know, I think some of these things you guys are working with are lost skills you know we we had this conversation last night about you know my, my 80 year old mom still cans and preserves stuff <laughs> and you know how that is becoming a lost skill and we have to look to our elders to relearn how to do that because it's going to be yeah. a necessity so so great that you guys are doing that um, I want to touch on the seed saving a little bit was was that yeah. the seeds of change project or is that a different um, it was the the seed saving was actually different. Um, and if I may explain, one other large program Blue Ridge Women in Ag offers is um, a sustainable food and agriculture grant. Um, it we offer that grant every year, and for the past well, this is our third year actually, so it's not that old. But um, Awards of $2,000 uh, go to Innovative Ideas. And Holly, who I was just speaking of, she wrote a grant and received the money to start this seed-saving business and also um, looking at small grain production. So she took that 
that money, that grant, and put it towards her farm. Um, 25% of last last year's income came from, or maybe it was 15%, came from her seed savings. So it was, um, she made a good amount of money off of that endeavor. Um, and then part of her, the requirement for the grant was to give a workshop to share the information with the community. That's, that's just what we require if you receive the grant. So right. that workshop was part of that. Um, would you like me to talk about Seeds of Change? Yes, please. Yeah, I okay. thought it was fascinating. <laughs> yes, so Seeds of Change, um, it's, it's a pilot project through Heifer International, which uh, some of your viewers might be familiar with Heifer. Um, they have traditionally been an organization that works in developing countries. So, And they have a really beautiful... Uh, operation. So you could say you want to buy something for your family for Christmas, but you know they don't need anything like a lamp or anything like that. Yeah. So you can actually buy a sheep or, you know, a pair of um, geese for some family in another country. Um, and then the family that receives that goat um, then is required to pass on the gift once that goat has... Um, you know, baby goats. And it's Heifer International has just done amazing things, um, but traditionally in other countries. Well, this past year, they started the pilot programs here in the United States, one in Appalachia and the other one um, in the Delta region, I believe, but I might be wrong. Um, but Seeds of Change Appalachia um, is working with a broad-based coalition across a five-county area, and we're trying to build a regional food system um, and value chain. So the Appalachian District Health Department is is partnering with Blue Ridge Women in Agriculture as being like the, just the organizational structure to it, you know. So Blue Ridge Women in Ag has the main staff involved with um, Seeds of Change, and um, the vision of the program is to promote public health and to end poverty by establishing a vibrant regional food system in the Appalachia region of North Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia. And the mission is to, you know, empower local food and farm enterprise, grow living wage jobs, increase access to healthy local food for all people, um, while fostering ecological stewardship. So, uh, through the funding of Heifer over, I think it's a five-year process, maybe even ten years, um, Heifer being involved. They're hoping it'll it'll um, grow into its own self-operating um, organization and also have this vibrant local food system. So uh, it's really exciting, and I don't know enough about it to... Well, that was a pretty good bit. Um, to expand more. Yeah, we're having. Oh, now see it. It. it un, you were frozen for a bit, and I didn't want to interrupt your thought. So we're good. Oh, okay. good. We'll just. <laughs> we'll just go. When you see the edit, you'll. You'll hear your audio, and you'll just be there. You know, kind of a little a model <laughs> shot, but it'll be fine. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. So that's some amazing, and it was you. You were talking about the Heifer Project, and I was thinking, yeah, you know, developing countries, third world countries. There are places in the United States that are rapidly approaching that. Yeah. Um, you know, I was up in Detroit uh, in October or so. Um, there are regions that that's going to become, you know, something that could probably be extremely helpful. So it's interesting to see it migrating back to to stateside and yeah. uh, and taking such good root. So um, I want to toss out like a personal kind of question because you're involved in in all these things I mean you are pretty much exemplifying what you're teaching I mean because you view the world in a whole whole vision your your work clearly is about that you know you're working at the school you're working with Blue Ridge I suspect that when you're not doing one of those two things you're probably working on your own garden and that sort of thing so um, what have you learned personally and gained personally from from the work you do professionally? How does that inform your your whole life other than just you know like paying the bills <laughs> um, 
Certainly. Well, um, I'll start on the shallow end um, with paying the bills, um, which I learned early on that um, making money is a necessity, but it wasn't, I'd never wanted it to be my goal. And so I wanted to creatively find ways to, you know, make a living enough to, to pay the bills and, and to uh, live as comfortably as I needed, which isn't um, as extravagant by <laughs> by some people's standards, but um, so I learned to diversify my skill set. You know, I um, learned how to create websites. Um, I teach yoga on the side. You know, um, having the master's degree and being able to teach um, was a great thing. Um, you know, some some graphic design work so I can make flyers well and and keeping up to date as much as possible on my technology so that I'm useful in, in, in those ways to keep up with, with the changing world. So um, diversifying my skill set, um, and I've always had a diversity of interests, so that worked really well, but um, that's really helped me um, make it um, and by doing the things, while well, at the same time doing the things that I love to do and feel passionate about. Um, as far as affecting myself um, at, you know, a higher level or a deeper level. Um, I'll tell you, my work in the classroom, I am so inspired by the students um, on a daily basis. And then, again, students that come through my class um, or graduate at the end or are out doing amazing internships and they take the time to say, hey, this is what I'm doing. Um, some of them say, because of your class, you know, I really changed the way I saw things and this is what I'm doing now. I mean, just one of those times, I just feel so amazing because um, where a lot of what has to do with where I'm at now are teachers and coaches and amazing people that affected me in my younger years. And that those people really inspired me to want to pass that along. And so now that I see myself in the role where I'm positively, positively affecting others, I just feel like the luckiest person in the world. Um, and as far as enriching my knowledge, you know, the work I get to do, it's constantly challenging me to learn uh, and to keep up to date on current events. And so because the class I teach, if I just stuck to, well, one thing, there's not just one textbook I can teach straight out of. I'm constantly having to adjust every semester. What what really sparked the interest of those students? And, and what's, what's a better way to approach this particular subject? So I'm just always fixing and adjusting and learning and finding awesome resources. And there's new stuff happening every day um, in terms of sustainability education. So I just love that. It keeps my mind alive and sharp and uh, just continuously hungry for knowledge. Um, and then uh, on a spiritual level, um, the yoga that I teach and learning about different philosophies around the world and, and how really thinking on that abstract level but also making it very internal um, with some of these issues that feel so huge that sometimes you just want to give up and say, I don't know what to do, but um, realizing that a lot of that conflict that you see on the outside um, also lives within, and so you have to really turn inside and see that too um, and deal with, you know, start at home. Um, that in itself, um, I'm constantly reminded that through yoga practice, through being face-to-face -face with students through working in the community. So that's a long explanation. But that was a great <laughs> explanation. I, I loved it. And, it, you know, it, 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 I told some people uh, just having the opportunity to have met you briefly and spoken to you at the cafe that I felt like you were one of those people that just spending a few minutes with you, you know, you, you walk away from it thinking, yeah, you know, there's hope. There's hope in the world. There's some people out there that are, you know, being a, a good example and trying to teach. And so uh, I think that was a great answer. So 
my um my hey. last question is um sort of I guess sort of rhetorical, but I think it's it's valuable. Um what advice and I just came up with this term while we were <laughs> sitting here. What advice do you have for the viewers on how to develop a sustainability sensibility? <laughs> nice. Okay, so advice to everyone <laughs> of how to develop a sustainability sensibility. My answer would be um, very similar to what I just ended with. And to me, I think it's very important for us all to, you know, start at home. Uh, and I don't just mean on, you know, in the external way of, well, are my light bulbs the right way? Or do I have the right light bulbs? And do I have reusable shopping bags? Like not, those things are all important, but um, really starting um, with your own self. Like what is it that I desire? What What is it that I how do I want to see the world, you know? Because a lot of times we might not really have a clear idea of what that might look like. Um, and also to foster this hunger for knowledge continuously, whether it's, you know, if all of you are watching this show now, I mean, just that in itself is saying, you know, I'm spending this evening opening my mind and taking in new information and so you know you're already there um, and um, I always encourage you know critical thinking so just because you are reading something or uh, listening to some advice always question you know what are the motives for this uh, story or this suggestion and um, not not necessarily being negative, but just mm -hmm. always having that critical mind so that you're not just um, taking everything in without thinking about it first or um, analyzing it. Um, and then uh, my next advice, and this is for me personally, um, I believe in the power of the positive. So um, a key part of that sustainability sensibility um, some may say, you know, well, it's already too far gone and, and, you know, climate change is already happening. And yes, you know, these, these truths are happening. There are uh, atrocities around the world, environmentally, socially, economically. Um, but I believe there's a power in the positive. And so I refuse to go down the path of we're doomed. Uh, and I... I have met people like you just described me, which I felt very honored that you said that. But you meet these people that are pure, positive beings. And those are the people that have made the difference in history. It hasn't been the folks that, that said, oh, well, oh well, you know, uh, women will never vote or slaves will never be free or, um, you know, this is the way it's always going to be. That's, that's never changed history. So um, I believe in positive thinkers and that the future will become what we imagine it to be so again a long answer but oh, that was a great answer <laughs> and what what a perfect way to to wrap this up it was it was wonderful i mean the you're right and nothing nothing ever good happened without somebody positive pushing it so right. so thank I mean it's easy you know as as activists and protesters and people working for change it's easy to get overwhelmed and just just I mean I I'm terribly cynical and there's like days that I'm just like it's a black cloud but it's true it's so true and thank you so much for sharing that and the 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 audience is loving loving that so you just <laughs> Um, so I want to um, thank you so much for spending your evening with us at the end of a long work day. It was a real pleasure and joy and extremely informative. Um, I'm excited because I'll get to see you again sometime soon. <laughs> and uh, the rest of the people are expressing their appreciation and thanks. So thank you for the work you're doing. And, you know, your students are lucky and the people you're around 
um, you guys are doing good works, and it, it is cause for optimism. So thank you so much. <laughs> well, I very much appreciate uh, your time and uh, your wonderful questions and your kind compliments. Uh, my pleasure, and I sure hope to see you again soon, too. All right. <laughs> if you